Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host uh, here today, this week, and every week. And I'm a filmmaker and a writer, and I've been working with CCF for 10 years, since 2011. Uh, we create you know, documentaries, we create treatment-based videos, we create live video series like this, but they all have the same mission in mind, and that is to, to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. We all, we all know, most of us that have been a, a, a part of this community for a while, how important that is for medical experts, for patients, for caregivers to understand and be educated about this disease. That's our goal. That's what we're trying to do here. Uh, and then on top of that, with this show specifically, uh, I think the net community is really powerful and I love to see the community that we've kind of cultivated here on the show and the chats and comments and conversations you all have in the, in the sidebar. Uh, I think it's just, just as beneficial as the information that we get from our guests. So if you are part of that community, go ahead and tell us where you're signing on from. Say hello to everybody. If you're new, uh, tell us where you're from, say hello, meet everybody. This community is, is invaluable to be a part of it. Everybody takes care of everybody. I see Florida in the house, Illinois, Washington state. And as always, uh, a lot of Canada, I think it's because of the time zone, but Hey, we love our neighbors up North. Hello from Evansville. Our daughter is a patient of Dr. Desari. She's our guest today. So we already have some loved Dr. Desari from, uh, from folks in the crowd that are showing up for you. Folks, uh, we always want to thank Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals for their support of, of Lunch with the Experts. We couldn't do this program without, without their support. And we always had this disclaimer, I like to read at the top of the program, and that is that the opinions expressed by our guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information uh, expressed uh, or provided in the presentation, rather. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Now, that last line is really the takeaway I want you to focus on. We're going to give you some, some answers to your questions and some good advice, but by no means do we know your specific case. So take that information and advice back to the team that does and make the best plan and path forward uh, for you specifically. As, as most of us know, each case of this disease is unique and therefore each path and plan uh, to move forward is as well. So we've already kind of tipped our hat to our guest today, and I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Arvind Dasari. How are you, Dr. Dasari? Doing great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me on the show. Really excited. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for being here. So uh, for those we, we clearly see in the audience, we have people who are familiar with you and your work already, which is exciting. For those that may not know uh, you or what you do, uh, tell us you know, a little bit about yourself, where you work, and, and, and the role that you fill in the neuroendocrine tumor community. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist um, at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, in Houston. I'm in the Department of GI Medical Oncology and focus on taking care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors uh, in the clinic and also uh, do a lot of research to understand these um, uh, cancers uh, better and to develop uh, new uh, treatments uh, for our patients. Uh, I've been doing this for about uh, a decade and it's uh, as I look back, um, as I was finishing fellowship about a decade ago, there were hardly any treatment options available, no FDA approvals. That's so gratifying and amazing to see the progress we've made uh, uh, over this period. And I think this is just the beginning for a lot more to achieve. Uh, you are so right. And, I, you know, I've been working now tangentially, at least uh, in, in the field with, through, through CCF's work for 10 years. And yeah, really, in that last chunk of 10 years, so much has happened in, the, in this in this um, space. that It's really it's really exciting. And I'm glad to hear that you're excited, you know, about things um, you know, in the next few years, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, folks, I see great numbers already. So Dr. Arvin must bring with him a reputation, uh, Dr. Desari rather. Um, but go ahead and start sending in your questions. I see questions coming in already. We're going to try our best to get to all of them. Inevitably, we don't, which is kind of a good problem because we get so many questions, but that allows us to keep the show coming back so that we can keep uh, giving you the, those answers and hopefully solving some of your problems. But we'll try to, to, to do our best to get to them. Just know that if we don't, or if you have a follow-up question, you can always message uh, CCF either here on their Facebook page, or you can direct message them, or you can reach them at carsonoid.org, their website. 
and we also this show will live here uh, for for replay um as long as facebook allows it's under the videos tab our whole library of luncheon with the experts is available you or anyone else can always refer back to them and starting monday we will republish to youtube but the real advantage is this interactive one-on-one -on -one session the getting a question across that you have that's been creating a problem for perhaps you and your team so if you know someone that would benefit from this interactive session go ahead and tag them in the comments let's get them here send them a message give them a call on the phone let's get as many people here as possible and to my point earlier about the amount of questions that we get, this really helps me. I ask every week. You do a great job every week. If you see a question in the comment section there on the right side of your screen that you also have or you're interested in the answer to, just under the, the uh, comment, you can reply or you can like it or love it. There's a lot of emojis you can use. They all work the same way for me, folks. And that kind of uh, effectively upvotes that question. If I see seven people have liked that question, it tells me there's a real demand for it. So as I'm scrolling through, I'll make sure to get that one across. Hope that makes sense, but it really helps me do my job, which is of course to serve you. Uh, that being said, let's go ahead and start taking your questions and, and uh, sending them in. Dr. Desari, I, first of all, my first question is, you know, doing the show as long as I have now, uh, this is not the first time MD Anderson uh ha, has come up in terms of the, the the staff there and the people that we've had on the show tell me a little bit about that institution that facility like and, and why it's such a uh, a big name we've had a lot of the uh, a lot of the doctors from that facility here on the show and um you know you see that a lot in the community but tell me a little bit about the work that's specifically done there yeah um so um i think the the biggest advantage uh, of working at a place like md anderson um, uh, which is an um, uh, NCI designated cancer center um, is that uh, you can leverage the collective wisdom and experience of everybody there. So it's not just one person um, or one group or one department that right. makes uh, this uh, place so great. Um, I think it's uh, the uh, team approach that we um, take, um, the multidisciplinary approach, uh, and the collective expertise that it brings. So we have um, surgeons who only worked on taking care of neuroendocrine patients all their careers. Similarly, medical oncologists have done the same, pathologists have done the same, radiologists who've done the same. And when you bring in this amazing amount of experience and expertise, uh, that's when uh, we make a real difference uh, for patients and their families. Absolutely. So if a lot of the people that are in, you know, attending the show today and dealing with this, this disease uh, aren't necessarily at a NCI designated cancer center, right? They're not at a specialty center. And that's part of what we try to do is help people, you know, who, who may not be dealing with specialists or at a net, you know, center for those people, how important is it to, to get to one of those centers? Is it imperative? Can they still benefit from the knowledge they have while still getting treated at their, at their home uh, hospital? Tell me, let's talk a little bit about the, the importance of a center like that for, for patients. If they can make it happen, should they? Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, as you alluded to, Rain, there are um, amazing uh, facilities with a lot of expertise for, uh, in taking care of neuroendocrine tumors around the country. Um, and the way I would view um, uh, neuroendocrine um, patient care would be a partnership. Uh, a partnership between uh, patients uh, and their providers, uh, and a partnership between providers at different uh, places uh, and uh, institutions. Um, so a lot of our patients, um, although they may not live here in Houston, um, come here for a consultation, for a conversation, um, and then we formulate a treatment plan. Uh, for some, it could be, well, I mean, maybe you could come back here as needed. For others, it could be, well, why don't we meet again in a few months, see how things are going, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, for others, it could be uh, they are coming back here and getting all their treatments here, uh, say in the setting of a clinical trial that may not be available um, elsewhere. 
So uh, I think we can find a plan that uh, fits every patient's um, needs. Mm. Um, I, I do think that there is value in consulting uh, at a center of excellence with um, uh, expertise uh, in taking care of neuroendocrine tumors uh, at some point uh, in uh, the um, a treatment course um, and subsequently decide what needs to be done and how often um, uh, they need to come back. I love that that word partnership. We talk a lot about here about the, the community, <clears throat> which is effectively saying the same thing, but I really like the way you put that, uh, the partnership between patient, I wrote it down, between patient provider and uh, from provider and, and, and other institutions that are working together. That's, that's I, I couldn't agree more. I want to plus one that, but I also love that very, you know, choice word that you used. It really is. And we see that sentiment echoed often on the show with other, other experts about how it's really this collaborative effort between the patient and, and the provider. And so, um, yeah, I, re I really like that. Um, that thought. Uh, we've already got a lot of questions coming in, so I want to make sure that we get to the people. I'm going to go ahead and start taking some of those. Um, but um, I love talking about that community aspect. That's what really kind of lights lights my heart on fire. Um, first question comes from Dutch from Atlanta. Dutch says, Dr. Desari, I met with you actually for a second opinion between surgeries, stage four nets, uh, and you recommended oral chemo and shrunk liver tumor 50% before the second surgery. So this is not a question, just a thank you. Uh, a lot of people had liked it. That's why I saw it. But yeah, you're already um, getting a lot of a lot of praise. And so that specific uh, case helped out Dutch a lot. So glad we well, could pass sharing from you, Dutch, and uh, glad things are going well. <laughs> Absolutely. So are we, Dutch. Hey, thanks for sharing that. Uh, from Christy, when the surgeon disconnects the duodenum and removes more than half of it, what effect does that have on calcium and vitamin production? Will this uh, affect osteopenia? And will it make GRED worse, GERD worse? I'm not familiar with that. Apologies. So um, uh, I think it would uh, depend on uh, what other uh, organs um, or parts of your intestine are being removed along with that um, surgery. Uh, the duodenum is typically removed um, either by itself when there are tumors uh, in the duodenum or say when we're doing uh, a surgery on the pancreas and part of the pancreas uh, is also uh, removed. So all those factors uh, come, into, uh, come into play. And you're absolutely right in that whenever we do these sort of surgeries, uh, there needs to be um, proper follow-up uh, with regards to making sure that there are no nutritional uh, deficiencies. Um, be it vitamin D, uh, B12, or, uh, uh, or other um, uh, essential nutrients. So kind of having that plan uh, in place, I think would be uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, and something that um, surgeons uh, will partner with you, the medical oncologist will partner with you and probably uh, monitor and have you meet with the nutritionist as needed. Got it. Hey, th uh, thanks, Christy, for your question. And also, I just realized that GERD, G-E-R-D, is an acronym. So uh, I, I had never heard that, but I am familiar with that. So, you know, I learn every day, too. That's why I love the show. Um, okay, next question. This is, this is one we talk a lot about PRRT. And I'm sure we'll have several questions today about that. But Kimberly says, do you think PRRT treatment will be approved for a second round in the U.S.? A great question, Kimberly, and that is uh, actually an area of active uh, debate um, and research uh, currently uh, in the community. Um, so there are clinical trials being planned uh, looking at uh, the safety and efficacy uh, of uh, redoing PRRT uh, for patients who uh, benefited it uh, benefited from it uh, before. And so we'll have those data uh, available uh, for us, uh, hopefully in the near future, in the next um, two, uh, two, three years. Um, having said that, um, we're already using this strategy uh, for patients uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, practice. Uh, and um, really have not had issues in getting this approved by uh, insurance 
uh, and getting it um, uh, delivered to, uh, to patients. Uh, the unknowns are kind of uh, trying to figure out which subset of patients would benefit from it the most right. uh, and how much can we really do, I mean, um, uh, in terms of safety, I mean, is it um, two treatments, three treatments, four treatments? So those sort of questions will refine as time goes on, mm-hmm. but we're already doing that. Awesome. Good to hear. Thanks, Kimberly. Okay, next question from Lynn and apparently several other people. How effective is bland embolization on killing metastasis to the liver? <clears throat> is bland preferred over radio embolization or chemo embolization? Uh, my net started in the pancreas and the latest copper dotatate scan last week showed the body was clean except for the liver. Yeah, Lynn, that is a, a fantastic uh, question and um, it's something that um, engenders a lot of debate and uh, if I may dare say a lot of passion, uh, <laughs> depending on uh, which type of uh, embolization procedure um, uh, each institution or provider uh, believes in. Um, um, so uh, there are no hard data that suggests that one approach uh, is uh, much better than another approach. So bland embolization as compared to radioembolization as compared to uh, chemoembolization. Um, and a lot of it is uh, driven by uh, patient circumstances and the expertise available at that institution. Uh, there are some institutions that have a lot of expertise in, uh, say, um, uh, radioembolization versus other modalities. Uh, and it also depends on, on the patient circumstance. For instance, if in patients who've had um, PRRT uh, before, uh, you have to be a little uh, careful uh, about the the volume of the liver that can be treated with uh, radioembolization again, because that's again, uh, two different forms of radiation that we're doing to the liver. Um, so all this kind of comes into play when uh, making those, um, uh, those decisions. So uh, the short answer is, um, I think uh, it, uh, any of these should be okay. Um, uh, just needs to be tailored to uh, the, uh, the particular circumstance, set of circumstances. Got it. I, I like the way you worded that. Uh, a lot of passion, we'll, we'll, we'll call it, <laughs> about these topics. Um, so Helen says, I'm going to get you to, to, to give us a little bit of foundation for this, but Helen asks, is your clinic a part of the phase two trial of alpha medics? And if so, what do you hope to see as far as the treatment results in your patients? So uh, the first part of that question is, 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 are they a part of it? But I'd like to, to explain to those who aren't familiar, like what, you know, what the, the trial is, is, is testing. Yeah, so um, PRRT um, uh, is um, a way of delivering radiation to um, the uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumor uh, cells. And the way we do that is by um, um, delivering a radioactive molecule to the uh, cancer cells by tagging it to uh, a drug that's very similar to octreotide or landreotide, with the idea that this would go attached to the cancer cells and then release the radioactive substance um, to uh, the uh, cancer cells. Now, the currently approved way of uh, doing this is by using a drug called lutetium-177 as the radioactive uh, payload. Um, and that uh, emits a type of radiation um, called beta particles. Um, and there are other uh, drugs that may emit uh, alpha particles, a different kind of radiation with a slightly different uh, properties. And uh, there are some uh, data um, that suggest that perhaps uh, alpha emitters uh, might be better, uh, but those data are not conclusive and those uh, clinical trials are uh, ongoing. So uh, we are um, uh, in um, discussions to kind of explore uh, this uh, avenue of treating uh, patients um, and hope to have clinical trials available um, soon um, uh, uh, using this modality, but nothing open as yet currently. Got it. Next question from Mona. Mona says, our daughter had a 50% liver resection three years ago at age 24. 
unknown primary. And she's been having PET scans with gallium or copper, alternating with CT and MRI scans every four months, now every six months, and they still haven't found the primary. Is this wait and see monitoring still the best plan? So it sounds like she may be getting a little frustrated and, and is just curious if, if the wait and see is the best thing to do at this point. Any suggestions? Yeah, and this is a clinical uh, challenge that we often uh, face about um, 15 to 20 percent of patients with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, in spite of doing all the tests uh, that are available, uh, including the uh, dotatate PET scans uh, that were mentioned, uh, we may not be able to find uh, the primary. Um, it could be uh, that this primary is uh, so small that we're just unable to pick it up um, on all the tests that uh, we are uh, doing currently. Um, in other cancers of unknown primary, uh, not necessarily just limited to neuroendocrine, there is also another theory that perhaps where the tumor started, the primary site, may have disappeared. It maybe was a small uh, site uh, and then spread, but then the primary site disappeared. So um, it could be because of um, a couple of reasons. Now, um, of one of these two reasons or something else. Now, there are clues that we could try and obtain based on the histology and doing some immunohistochemical stains on the uh, specimens that were uh, resected. Uh, because each primary site has a different pattern of immunohistochemical stains uh, that could maybe point us in, in, the, in a certain direction. But even that, like I said, is not uh, always uh, really successful. Um, uh, and um, without really knowing where to look, I think it'll be a lot of tests uh, that may not really give us a whole lot of benefit. I, I hear you though about the, the frustration and that, that you're facing. Got you. Well, thank you, Dr. Desari. And thanks for your question, folks. If you joined us a little bit later, you've just joined us recently. This is a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation Luncheon with the Experts. And today our guest is Dr. Arvind Desari from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Great questions today so far, folks. But that's not a surprise to me. I know how you all bring it and we're going to keep on going. Next question comes from Lisa, and the question is, has anything been successful for brain uh, nets, brain neuroendocrine tumors? This is some, every now and then, I'd like to talk a little bit too about the, the frequency of that. We, every now and then we get question about this. So um, what's your knowledge about that and, and anything that has been developed to treat brain nets? Yeah, so I presume that this is uh, alluding to neuroendocrine tumors that have uh, spread to the brain. Um, uh, but started in another um, site. Um, I assume so. Um, so um, that is much more common in small cell lung cancers where we tend to see it very often. Um, <clears throat> to a lesser extent, uh, much lesser extent uh, in lung carcinoids and not very uh, often with neuroendocrine tumors starting from other sites, mm -hmm. although these could still spread to the brain and uh, uh, um, taking care of patients whose tumors have spread to the optic nerve, the, so the nerve that uh, connects the eye to the brain and uh, to other parts of the brain. So um, with regards to um, kind of uh, management and how to take care of uh, these areas in the brain, uh, it would depend on um, a few things. Uh, firstly, where, um, where is this starting from? For instance, if it's starting related to small cell lung cancer, then patients uh, may need to be treated more aggressively um, um, uh, as compared to say a carcinoid tumor with a small spot somewhere uh, in the brain. Um, in general, uh, management of these uh, spots uh, in the brain uh, would be um, along the lines of surgery, but that's provided it's uh, limited to one or um, a few uh, locations. Um, radiation um, uh, can be uh, done, uh, again, uh, depending on um, 
the extent of involvement that could be focused radiation and occasionally whole brain um, radiation. And um, um, <clears throat> the um, uh, patients with really slow growing tumors um, that um, were incidentally diagnosed on imaging, uh, we could carefully monitor them uh, in conjunction with our neurosurgeons, neuro-oncology uh, colleagues um, to monitor for uh, any progression. Uh, what is really interesting is that we've seen patients with some brain tumors who've actually responded to PRRP treatment because that tends to uh, go into the brain too, just as an aside. All right, thank you so much. Um, from Jim, Jim says, does bland embolization rely on the same markers as radio embolization? I do not have... Excuse me. I do not have the markers, and I'm often frustrated by the limited treat treatment options available. Um, so, Jim, um, I am not sure what uh, the markers um, um, are uh, alluding to. Um, I are those uh, tumor markers in the blood, uh, like uh, chromogranin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, versus um, uh, maybe an imaging modality. Um, yeah, Jim, if, if you're still around, I uh, see that, that comment was only a few minutes ago, uh, and you have any other information for, for some clarity, let us know. We definitely want to get you some answers. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving forward, but we're still in the same realm We've talked about embolization already today. Uh, Lynn has a question, says it's me again. Uh, will bland embolization, embolization kill metastases to the liver? Uh, yeah, so hi, uh, Lynn. So uh, perhaps I didn't answer that question completely <laughs> last time. Um, so it uh, would um, depend on the uh, size of the tumor and the uh, extent of uh, embolization. Um, I would say um, uh, in uh, small tumors, the, um, uh, the control uh, um, rate would be much higher than say when we're treating really large uh, tumors or large areas of the liver. So, uh, it, um, so it does happen uh, in uh, small uh, tumors, but as the size of the tumor gets larger and larger, uh, as you can imagine, it'll be harder to treat the entire volume of the, uh, of the tumor effectively. Got it. Hey, thanks, Lynn. And, and folks, this, this, Lynn, this is a great example of, of what I try to, to reiterate every week. If you, most of you all hang out for the entirety of the show, which is great. Um, so if there's anything, any information for clarity or any follow-up questions and you're still here and we're able to get to it, we will. So great job, Lynn. Thanks for your question. Thanks for being here. Um, next question from our friend Dutch. We've already kind of spoken with today. I had a part of my pancreas removed along with five other abdominal organs. Because I now have a partial pancreas, am I more susceptible to pancreatic cancer or diabetes? Um, um, hi again, uh, Dutch, and uh, seems like uh, you've had a, a major surgery and glad you've recovered uh, well. Uh, with regards to the implications of um, resection of the pancreas and what it means for um, your future um, health, um, so surgery on the pancreas um, does not necessarily increase the risk of future uh, incidence of pancreatic um, cancer um, by itself, uh, unless there is a uh, pre-existing um, condition, say in the uh, case of neuroendocrine tumors, say if there's a hereditary condition like MEN1, that could increase the risk, um, but certainly not pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Um, with regards to your uh, second question, as, as the, the second part of your question about uh, the risk of diabetes, um, um, so the two main functions uh, of um, uh, the pancreas would, are to uh, A, produce uh, hormones, um, uh, which have multiple functions, um, uh, the main one being um, kind of glucose control uh, through uh, insulin production. Um, so when a part of uh, the pancreas is removed, uh, there could be an increased risk of developing um, 
uh, diabetes um, as a result uh, because of lowered uh, insulin uh, production. The second thing that we also need to remember is that the pancreas also produces enzymes that could help uh, digest food. Um, so again, when you're having um, a surgery on the pancreas, that enzyme production could go down and that could interfere with uh, food uh, digestion. Um, so that needs to be uh, monitored. Uh, patients may have diarrhea, uh, and other symptoms, um, but uh, both the uh, diabetes and this enzyme uh, deficiency, if they do occur, can be um, identified and taken care of very easily. Got it. Uh, just heard back from Jim, who was asking the question, does gland embolization rely on the same markers as radio embolization? He said, by markers, of course, I mean receptors. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, again, so does bland embolization rely on the same receptors as radio embolization? I do not have uh, the receptors and I'm often frustrated by the limited treatment options available. Any thoughts for Jim? Yeah, thank you for uh, that uh, clarification, uh, Jim. So um, the, uh, the embolization uh, procedures, um, uh, be it bland embolization or radio embolization. As you know, the basic principle there is that we uh, identify the blood vessels um, in the liver that are going to the tumor um, and inject um, those blood vessels um, um, to uh, treat the tumor uh, directly. Um, in um, the case of bland embolization and radio embolization, the expression of somatostatin receptors uh, is not really what we're looking at. For these procedures to be successful, what we're looking at is how well are the blood vessels reaching uh, the tumor um, and uh, how much of what we're going to inject will uh, actually go to the tumor versus to other parts of the liver or other parts of the body. So they don't necessarily depend on the expression of some of the statin receptors. It's more about the vascular or blood supply to the tumor. Got it. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, from Susan. Susan says, is it possible to use PRRT at a lower dose or some other way using radiation systematically as a way to clean up microscopic nets similar to the way that radiation is used after thyroid cancer? And if so, why isn't this being uh, done currently? Yeah, great question. So, and that is um, one of uh, the main unanswered questions hmm. uh, in the field uh, currently. Uh, that is, in patients who've been diagnosed uh, with um, uh, neuroendocrine tumors that can be removed with surgery? Um, are there um, ways, uh, are there treatments that we can do after surgery to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back uh, in the future, uh, be it PRRT or another uh, approach? Um, the uh, challenge with uh, trying to answer this uh, question is that um, as you can imagine, this would require a clinical trial where we're having one group of patients who uh, just get surgery and are monitored for recurrence. The other group that uh, gets um, um, surgery followed by another treatment and then monitored for uh, recurrence. Now, the issue is because these neuroendocrine tumors are A, rare, and B, because they um, are slow growing and can uh, recur anytime up to seven to 10 years after um, surgery. Um, the, doing this sort of trial to definitively answer this question has been really, really uh, challenging and difficult. Um, nevertheless, uh, I'm happy to report uh, that we are making uh, some progress although not necessarily with PRRT, but there is a clinical trial that just started for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors who, who have had a, a surgery where their tumors have completely been removed. And this clinical trial is asking whether capecitabine and temozolomide after surgery would uh, reduce the risk of the cancer coming back in the future. Uh, this is one of the really uh, first trials that is trying to do this, and I'm really, really hopeful that 
This will provide impetus and encouragement for other investigators throughout the world to further answer this question, especially with PRRP. Got it. Awesome question. Thank you so much. Uh, from Karen, the question is, would taking antihistamine, antihistamines uh, help lessen serotonin levels? And I'd also like to discuss, you know, the, the role of serotonin and, and why one would want to lessen, lessen those, those levels. But then let's take our question too at face value. Would, would taking antihistamines help lessen those or reduce those levels? Um, so um, thanks for that uh, question, uh, uh, Karen. And, and Rain, you raise a great um, point and kind of maybe providing a little bit of background to mm -hmm. uh, answer uh, that uh, question um, well. So um, what we know is that um, patients uh, with uh, certain kinds of neuroendocrine tumors uh, produce uh, hormones or chemicals that are released into the blood. Um, and these hormones and chemicals uh, can uh, cause a lot of um, um, symptoms. Um, and at the, uh, when we think of uh, carcinoid syndrome, um, the classic uh, flushing and diarrhea that patients present with, um, that is uh, typically uh, from a tumor starting in the small bowel or the vicinity. And uh, these tumors produce a certain chemical called um, um, serotonin uh, that is released into uh, the blood. Uh, and uh, it's the serotonin that tends to cause a lot of these uh, symptoms. So uh, when we are trying to treat patients uh, with carcinoid syndrome, our goal is to try and lower uh, serotonin. Now, in these patients with tumors starting in the small bowel with the classic carcinoid syndrome, uh, how much does histamine play a role in terms of causing and driving these uh, symptoms is uh, uncertain. It's probably other chemicals more than uh, uh, histamine. However, there are certain neuroendocrine tumors starting in uh, other organs, uh, such as occasionally in the stomach and maybe occasionally in the lung, uh, that uh, where maybe histamine may play a, a larger role um, and whether there, in those cases, the use of antihistamines would be uh, helpful uh, is something that can be uh, discussed. But in most patients, it's mostly serotonin that's driving these symptoms. Got it. So, you know, uh, men mentioning carcinoid syndrome, uh, this is also a topic that comes up a lot. Uh, Rebecca says, do you suggest continuing Santostatin for carcinoid syndrome while doing PRRT? I've seen different, uh, I've seen different approaches. A great question, Rebecca. Um, so um, the traditional approach has been that um, uh, in patients who are on um, octreotide um, or landreotide uh, initially, and uh, their tumors start growing, and we're thinking about other treatment options. Uh, we would continue octreotide and landreotide um, in patients who are having uh, excess um, uh, hormone production. So we talked about carcinoid syndrome. Um, so those sort of patients uh, we would continue uh, these treatments with the goal to control the hormone production um, and control the carcinoid syndrome. And while adding on another treatment to control the tumor uh, growth uh, and spread. In patients who do not have this uh, hormone production, who do not have the carcinoid <clears throat> syndrome, it would be reasonable to stop the octreotide or landreotide and just switch to another form of um, uh, a form of a treatment. Mm -hmm. So Jesse says, what if I have excessive carcinoid syndrome, but, and my serotonin levels always come back normal? Yeah. Um, and uh, Jesse, that is a fantastic uh, question. Um, and I think um, it would be worthwhile to uh, take a step back in this situation. Um, and uh, before labeling uh, these symptoms as necessarily related to carcinoid syndrome, kind of casting a wider net and looking at uh, other causes that could potentially be um, uh, contributing to these ongoing symptoms. Let's take the example of diarrhea, which is often a major uh, issue for patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, 
diarrhea could certainly be related to carcinoid syndrome, but it could also be related to um, other uh, issues. For instance, in patients who've had surgery where a part of their bowel is removed, uh, just that could uh, post-surgery could cause uh, diarrhea. Uh, in patients who are on octreotide or lanreotide, uh, believe it or not, just those drugs can paradoxically cause diarrhea as well. How do they do that? Remember a little while ago, we talked about how the pancreas produces uh, enzymes to help digest food. Uh, octreotide and lanreotide actually interfere with that enzyme production. So that can cause uh, diarrhea uh, as well. And, um, and there could be other uh, ongoing reasons such as infections or uh, other medications that patients may be on. So the first step would be to actually make sure that uh, the symptoms uh, that, uh, you're experiencing are indeed related to carcinoid syndrome and rule out um, other causes, especially if um, uh, the 24-hour uh, urine 5-HIA and other things are within a normal limits. After um, kind of ruling out all these other causes, if the consensus is that this is still related to uh, carcinoid syndrome, it could be related to other chemicals other than serotonin that the tumors are producing. And in that case, the focus should be to try and do a better job of controlling the tumor uh, so that your uh, the hormone production also uh, goes down. Got it. Hey, thanks for your question. Uh, you guys, as always, you all are doing a great job of, of sending in good good questions i have a question um it's a broad question or um it may be 2k specific but let's try to help uh this is from azad and azad says on my copper 64 pet ct scan found tumors on my pancreatic lymph nodes eight millimeters uh, and also 20 plus tumors in the liver and the question is what should i do about them so i know that's a big question but let's let's try to give some some guidance if we can what do you think in terms of like first suggestions to azad <clears throat> um, yeah, so um, I think the first, um, uh, so uh, maybe we could use this as an opportunity to um, go down uh, kind of um, an algorithm, so to speak, my kind of my thinking when it comes yeah, to absolutely. how we approach uh, taking care of patients with uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumors. Totally. Um, so um, we'll limit the discussion to well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, which would be most um, relevant for uh, to Assad's um, case. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, thing that we um, always look for is um, um, where is the tumor starting from? In this case, it appears that maybe in the pancreas, but it, I, I cannot be 100% certain, but mm -hmm. just based on the fact that there are lymph nodes around the pancreas, maybe it's started in the pancreas. Uh, the second question is how far has it spread? So it appears to have, uh, be involving the liver. Um, so, um, and a related question is can these spots all be removed uh, safely and completely with surgery? Uh, perhaps not based on the information we have. Um, uh, if um, at this point, then we're looking at how best can we uh, manage um, uh, 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 the patient's care with a goal to prevent further growth and spread of the tumors. Uh, if this is a slow growing tumor um, with a very few spots here and there, it would be reasonable to monitor very closely uh, with uh, scans. On the other hand, if this is a patient um, who has a lot of tumor spots scattered throughout the body um, who needs treatment immediately, then um, we Think about starting treatment. Um, in the uh, in most patients, uh, the first uh, treatment option would be octreotide or lanreotide, um, and um, uh, the reason it is important to figure out where the tumor started from is if it's in the case of the pancreas, um, these tumors tend to respond well to uh, chemotherapy, unlike neuroendocrine tumors starting in other areas. Um, so these chemotherapy would be in the form of pills, temozolomide and cytopine. So the advantage of kind of thinking about the chemotherapy is that it gives us a higher chance of shrinking the tumors uh, yeah. kind of, uh, on the scans. And that would be especially relevant for patients who have very widespread tumors or really large um, uh, uh, tumors. 
Um, and um, so that would be kind of a general uh, approach uh, for patients uh, with neuroendocrine tumors whose tumors are not producing hormones. Now, as we said before, in a patient who, whose tumors are producing hormones or chemicals, we automatically go ahead and start uh, our creatinine lambia type, no matter what. Got it. Well, thank you so much for that. Appreciate your question, Azad. Um, next question from Nicole. And folks, we have just about 15 minutes left. Again, very proud of you with the awesome questions today, but that is not abnormal. You always do a great job, but I love these conversations that we that we generate. And so Nicole says, I get blood work every six weeks to two months because my chromogranin A continually rises. I have had a CT scan, endoscopy, colonoscopy, all clear, except for my stable le left lung mass and my stable left adrenal gland mass. I can't help but worry that it's growing uh, somewhere microscopically. So is there any suggestions as to what I should be looking for? Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, that uh, question, uh, Nicole. Um, um, so um, chromogranin um, is not the best of tests because it could be affected by um, um, of certain medications that uh, you may be taking, how your um, uh, liver or kidneys are uh, functioning. So uh, in fact, kind of the latest uh, iteration of the um, uh, guidelines, uh, the um, expert guidelines called the NCCN guidelines are kind of uh, suggesting that we shy away from checking uh, chromogranin on, on a regular um, basis uh, for this reason. Um, and now the question is, um, if there are changes in chromogranin, uh, the gold standard to follow that up with would be doing a scan, which seems like you are uh, getting on, on a regular uh, basis, uh, which overall do not seem to show uh, any major changes, which is uh, very reassuring. Um, if there is concern that there is some occult uh, growth and spread uh, that is not being captured on the um, CT scan that you're getting, uh, one consideration would be to uh, see if there would be a role uh, or need uh, for getting a dotatate uh, PET scan, um, because that could give you a little more um, information, more refined information, and perhaps hopefully some reassurance. All right. Thanks so much. Next question from Ruby. Ruby says, do, do, does NETS or do NETS cause systemic inflammation? I've been on prednisone for 10 months for high uh, C-reactive protein levels. Ruby, uh, thank you for uh, that uh, question. Um, so um, C-reactive protein could be elevated um, because of a multitude of reasons. Um, and it's hard to pinpoint just based on an elevated C-reactive protein what the cause could be. Um, um, so um, uh, one of the reasons for an elevated C-reactive protein could be um, um, a cancer of any kind, including a neuroendocrine tumor, but not to the point that it would cause any symptoms um, are not to the point that uh, you would need to be on steroids, especially for such a prolonged period of time. So it might be worthwhile to uh, make sure that there is nothing uh, else going on that could be contributing to um, your ongoing uh, issues. Got it. Thanks so much for your question. Ruby, hope you're having a great day. Next question coming from Sharon. Sharon says, we hear progress is being made, but after six years, uh, just lost it with that. But after six years, all my husband uh, with renal insufficiency uh, to 2.1 just gets sandostatin 60 milliliters every 28 days. Okay, now I'm caught up. Tried radiation on the liver, three large tumors. Now his net spot has lit up his entire uh, area, solid glow from kidneys to the liver and across to the pancreas. And even the on oncologist is baffled. Um, so it's not, I don't really see a direct question there, but any, any thoughts on that situation? And do you need me to, to, to read back any of that? Cause it was a little, there was a lot of data. 
Yeah, maybe I could try and uh, summarize the information we have uh, so mm. far. So yeah. um, it appears that um, 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 currently um, um, uh, the patient is on um, octreotide that's been give, being given once a month. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, this is in the setting of a neuroendocrine tumor that's lighting up on a glutathate scan. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and uh, treatment options may be limited uh, related to um, the kidney function being off uh, somewhat based on the creatinine of 2.1 or something uh, in that um, range. So, um, uh, and perhaps the concern is that there's been some recent um, evidence of tumor growth or, uh, or spread. So where do we go from here next? Essentially, that's what I get from it. It's like, we hear that, that she starts off with, we hear progress is being made, but after six years with, you know, these treatments, now we're seeing uh, that the entire area is lighting up from kidneys to liver to across the pancreas and the oncologist is baffled. So yeah, I hear that frustration as well. So I think, I think you're on the money there and share and feel free to, to, to clarify if we're off the mark there, but let's see. Yeah. Any, any thoughts to, to, to help with some of that frustration? Or... Yeah, Sharon. I mean, I, I hear you, uh, and this is an incredibly challenging situation to be in, um, uh, given, uh, that, uh, any drugs that we put into the body need to be cleared, um, by the liver and or the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to be very, very cautious about the safety of any treatments that we're able to do uh, in patients with, um, say, kidney uh, and or uh, liver uh, dysfunction. Um, having said that, um, I mean, there are uh, certain treatments that could still be done with uh, dose reductions, um, uh, with close uh, monitoring. Um, uh, for instance, we are able to do PRRT in some patients with a lower kidney function as we get more and more um, experience. Uh, we're able to do uh, treatments like Everolimus um, uh, in patients uh, with a lower kidney uh, function. So there are options. Um, so don't, uh, don't give up. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, just... Um, trying to explore all options uh, and, um, and looking what uh, looking at what would fit the best uh, in, for, for your husband's situation uh, is what I would, uh, I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. And again, feel free to uh, send us any more information if you have it. Folks, we've got just shy of 10 minutes left and, and if several more questions to get to. We're going to try to get to them all. But again, I'll reiterate follow up with CCF if you didn't get your question answered or if you have uh, further questions we'll try to get you that information and we are here every week so come on back uh from Mervisa Mervisa I believe that I'm pronouncing that correctly um I have neuroendocrine cancer with metastases on the liver and the bones primary tumor is in the rectum and they are suggesting me to have a segmentectomy uh on the liver for lesions and after that treatment with, with lutetium, you know, 177. So my question is, is, is it better to treat the primary versus the metastases uh, in the liver? Which, which is the better approach, um, I guess, first? So uh, that makes sense. That's a great uh, question um, in, uh, in that, what is the role of uh, doing surgery uh, in patients whose tumor has spread to uh, multiple areas uh, of the body. <clears throat> I think uh, there are uh, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, providers who um, believe in uh, the concept of debulking, so where you're able to, say, remove a certain amount of the tumor that may improve our chances of the tumor responding to further treatments. Um, there are others who uh, believe that um, perhaps just doing these treatments without any uh, surgery would also be uh, reasonable. So uh, I think trying to make that decision will require more details about how the tumors look on the liver um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, at other areas. Uh, with regards to trying to do surgery um, on the primary tumor, which in this case would be uh, the rectum, um, uh, I think, again, um, it would depend on uh, what the uh, reason for uh, the surgery is. Is, is. is it because the tumor is causing, um, say, uh, some bleeding, pain, 
uh, or some obstruction uh, in the rectum, uh, or is it just to uh, kind of uh, get rid of the tumor before doing uh, other uh, treatments? Um, there's no one right or wrong approach here, um, and you might get more than one uh, opinion um, about what sure. the best approach is. Um, but our approach is to, um, at MD Anderson, is to go ahead with the treatments and reserve surgeries for those who may develop complications, um, say from the spots in the liver or the rectum um, otherwise. Got it. Uh, folks, I think I have time for just a, a handful more and maybe just a couple. Uh, Mary says, what measurement is considered a large tumor? If there is a line somewhere, where is that line? Yeah. Mary, I, I wish I could answer that uh, question. I know you're not going to like uh, this answer, but it depends. <laughs> That's so, uh, it, it depends on the location of the tumor, uh, what organ it is in, and even within the organ where exactly it is. As you can imagine, say, if, if within the liver, it's in a really critical area, um, a two centimeter uh, lesion would be a very, very um, uh, uh, kind of uh, concerning, say, if it's right on the blood vessel or a bile duct, um, as compared to somewhere out in the periphery of the liver where there are no critical organs and a tumor that's three, four, five centimeters is still okay. So, um, I think what would be helpful in general is rather than looking at the size of one particular tumor, just taking a step back and looking at uh, the total volume, uh, say in the case of the liver, what volume of the liver is involved, and overall, let's say, is the liver uh, functioning well or not? Another question from Laura. Laura says, does PRRT help with um, metastases, metastasis to the bones? It absolutely does, um, and uh, it does control uh, tumors in uh, the bones as well. Got it. Um, still got a few more minutes, folks. We're going to squeeze them in. Dana says, is it typical to see a spike or an increase of chromogranin levels when starting lanreotide? My husband started lanreotide in September, and each month the chromogranin levels are increasing. Uh, is it typical for levels to plateau or decrease with further injections? Uh, and if so, how long does it usually take to see if the injections are working? Yeah, again, chromogranin is not the best of tests to monitor how the tumor is doing. So I would um, rely more heavily on um, the scans and any ongoing uh, symptoms. Uh, in, in general, uh, the chromogranin levels um, should uh, plateau uh, within um, um, uh, maybe two to three months. But again, I wouldn't um, make decisions solely based on the chromogranin level. Got it. Uh, last question, Dr. Desari. We talked at the beginning of the program about the previous 10 years, which we called attention to how uh, profound some of the leaps and bounds have, have been for this disease. Let's cast forward a little bit. What do you see coming down the pipeline that you're excited about, whether in the next few years or even the bigger picture, like five to 10? Um, so uh, in, in the case of uh, newer treatment options, um, uh, I would say kind of um, building on the successes we've had with PRRT, Everlimus, Sinitinib, uh, trying, uh, getting more and more new drugs that would be available for our patients. And uh, my hope and my vision uh, would be that um, a neuroendocrine tumor uh, diagnosis would change from one of cancer to that of a chronic condition, much like diabetes or um, mm -hmm. high cholesterol, where, patients just yes, uh, live their uh, lives um, without major issues. Um, the other um, um, kind of uh, area that we need to uh, also focus on is, um, as has been discussed multiple times, the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors has been really going up. Uh, and so we'll have more and more patients with um, early stage disease. So trying to figure out um, who do we do surgery on after surgery? Who's at the risk of the cancer coming back? Um, so trying to uh, understand those sort of uh, questions, I think, would be, uh, would be helpful. The common theme to all this is kind of um, doing more research, uh, doing more research in the clinic in terms of clinical trials, uh, and doing more research in the lab, uh, trying to understand the underpinnings 
uh, of neuroendocrine tumors, what drives them, what causes them, uh, what makes them grow and spread, and really using that knowledge uh, to the benefit of our patients. Absolutely. Well, one comment I want to read before we go. Mona says, thank you so much, Dr. Desari and Rain. Very informative today. We are so glad to have Dr. Desari uh, as part of our team of doctors. And you know what? I am so glad Dr. Desari uh, shared some time with us today. We appreciate you being here so much. Thank you very much. It's, it's been really um, um, kind of very gratifying. And uh, Rain, like you mentioned multiple times on, uh, uh, on the um, show today, um, uh, uh, neuroendocrine patients and their families are so um, involved, proactive, and in charge of their care. Uh, and that's what uh, makes this so um, amazing, uh, this community, the partnership and the teamwork. The partnership and the teamwork. I totally agree. And, and gratifying is such a great word. I have to, to agree there. I feel that same gratification uh, working within this community uh, as well. So Thank you all the community, uh, as always, for being here also. And, and we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. I'll reiterate one more time before we go. If you have follow-up questions, reach out to Carson Can uh, Cancer Foundation, either here uh, on their Facebook page, you can send them a message or reach them at carsonoid.org. And again, we'll have the video posted as soon as this program's over. It'll be available for replay and Monday it'll be on YouTube. Um, and thanks again, as always, to our presenting sponsor, by Bi uh, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without them, we couldn't do this program. We will have one more episode next week, and then I think we'll take some break uh, for the end of the year, for the holidays. So my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching, and please join us next time, next week, for Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.